Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope you all enjoyed lunch. Our next speaker um, is Hugh Rundle, um, a librarian and um, information activist. Um, Hugh sure. runs the New Cardigan uh, meetup in Melbourne um, for glam professionals and is here to talk to us about the joys and challenges of moving to open source in local government. Thank I you, am. Hugh. Thank you. Um, so thanks for being patient while we work through those technical problems. Um, so uh, yeah, as Fiona said, I'm, uh, I'm Hugh and I'm a librarian. I've worked in local government for uh, 16 years-ish uh, and in library systems for about eight years. <clears throat> I'm an open source enthusiast uh, and I'm an amateur coder and um, I code in JavaScript, but I agree with Clinton um, that I probably should have listened to everyone's advice and started with Python, but here we are. Um, so today I am speaking as myself, um, but I will be speaking about uh, my work at Brimbank City Council. I'm not talking on behalf of Brimbank, I'm talking on behalf of myself. These are my views, not the views of Brimbank. Caveat, caveat. <laughs> um, okay, so in... Um, about mid-2015, I spoke to my manager and <clears throat> started speaking to library staff about changing our library management system. So we were using Amlib, which is a proprietary system. We'd been using that for about 20 years. Uh, and as far as I could tell, there had not been very many updates to the software in that entire period of time. Uh, it was really terrible. So <clears throat> um, we also, uh, so Brimbeck's in the outer west of, of Melbourne. Um, it's, it's not a particularly wealthy area. We didn't have uh, a lot of funds. So Amlib's um, not a super expensive system. Uh, so we're kind of looking around and to be honest, I was sort of happy to have anything that wasn't Amlib, but um, <laughs> what I really wanted to do was, was move to Koha ILS, which is an open source uh, library management system, which I'd been keeping an eye on for um, the last a few years looking for an excuse to, to implement it. <clears throat> uh, and in November last year, we finally went live. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so from about June 2015 until November 2017, that's how long it took us. Uh, and everyone I spoke to in library land um, about Koha, unless they said, what's that, um, said, who else is using it? So that's why I called my talk today, who else is using it? I think it, that question kind of reveals a little bit about how local government and libraries think about, uh, think about software. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of context for our migration process um, and some strategies that you can use if you want to work with local government and open source. Um, I'm aware from Bonnie's question that probably most of you are um, techie people rather than glamour people, uh, which is kind of exciting. but um, a little bit nerve-wracking at the same time. And um, specifically, I'm talking about local government, partially because that's my context. I've always worked for local government. But um, also, local government runs most public libraries in Australia and also runs many galleries and museums, probably more than you'd realise. So uh, local government is a glam employer and many, many glam institutions are run by local government. So if you want Australian GLAM to go open source, you need to understand how local government works. So part one is going to be how local government works. Part two is going to be how to make open source the default choice in local government. And I'll try to speed up because I'm behind time already. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you why local government buys software like it buys trucks. And um, first of all, I'm going to talk to you about what citizens want. So users of government services want them to be easy, they want them to be clear, reliable, consistent and responsive. And what government has mostly done in the past is concentrated on being consistent and reliable um, and not necessarily easy, clear and responsive. So citizens will often put up with things that aren't shiny and the latest thing as long as they work reliably and don't waste their time. When you see people on Twitter and Facebook and whatever, complaining about government services, it's not normally that they're complaining because it's not the latest thing. It's because it's completely broken and just doesn't work. So that's, you know, people will put up with it as long as it actually does 
what it's supposed to do. Um, but also, people are you know, really impatient when, when it's obvious that this thing is broken and it's fairly obvious what the fix is and yet government doesn't seem to be able to fix it. You know, they don't care about uh, your budget cycle or your licence agreement with your vendor. They just want it done. Um, now, what service delivery staff in government want is they want to be competent at their job. They want to look like they're competent at their job. They want to be efficient. I know that may surprise you, but they really do. Um, and they actually want to make you happy as citizens. Um, and the, the other really big thing that our frontline service people want is that they want to be able to take your suggestions for improving the service and actually do something about it. Um, and, and that's something we struggle with traditionally. And what local government bureaucrats want, they want practical solutions to real problems. Okay, they're really uninterested in your philosophy about how you know, things should be. They, they're like, this is the problem we're resolving here, what's the practical solution? Uh, they're, they're really into improving life for their community, um, but they also need to balance the budget and they also need to stay out of trouble, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so why does government buy software like it buys battleships? So um, Hannah Schenk and Sarah Hudson wrote a piece in the Washington Post a couple of days ago, uh, which is awesome because I was going to talk about this anyway, but they uh, have written this amazing article which sort of explains all of this pretty well. Um, and it was about the Hawaii missile false alarm. Um, and what it shows about government software procurement in large democracies. So what they said was government systems aren't built this way because of lack of funds or laziness or broken promises or stupidity. Many within government care deeply about the state of its technology, but to improve they have to overcome massive systemic hurdles. The public sector buys software and systems the same way it buys battleships. Um, and in the local government context, we obviously don't buy battleships, but we do buy trucks. And that's kind of the same way we, we, we build our software as well. Um, so I'll come back to Hawaii later on, but for now we need to look at the local government equivalent. So government doesn't make decisions about budgets and procurement like private businesses do. We make all our decisions, well, not all of them, but like most of our budget decisions are made in the open. People can see the decisions we're making and they can have an opinion on those decisions. Legislation limits how local government can raise funds, how we can expend them, and even how much debt councils can accumulate before they're in big trouble or maybe even the council is sacked. And this is all great. It's really well intentioned. Um, it's all, it's democracy, it's accountability, it's open government. I'm in favour of all of these things. Um, but there is also a cost to that. Uh, and the cost is <laughs> that when you're working in the environment where all of your decisions can be seen by everybody else and when you make a mistake, it's on the front page of the newspaper and when you do something really well and have success, you get a corporate thank you card and a cinema ticket. Um, what that means is that you don't take very many risks because risks don't pay off. So, what are the assumptions that local government historically makes about software? So the first one is that people interacting with the software are all going to be staff. This is traditionally the view that government takes. Um, people interacting with the software will all use organisation supplied equipment. And people interacting with the software will all be in desk jobs using PCs. Now even though we know this isn't true, this is normally the way local government thinks about software. Um, procuring software is like buying a truck. It's a one-off purchase and it all gets paid out of a single cost code at a particular point in time. Um, the software won't need to be updated more than once every three years. And <laughs> Current technologies will continue to exist for that entire period of time. And proprietary software vendors are very reasonable people and they totally won't gouge us uh, once we're locked into their product. <laughs> so these are all the assumptions that local government historically has made about software. Um, and so then we have some kind of matching risks here. So <clears throat> uh, there's a big risk that council will pay too much money because the procurement process wasn't competitive enough. Um, basically, the process might be corrupt or um, we won't actually you know, ask the right questions. 
Um, the system might not perform the necessary functions because the requirements weren't all you know, made clear at the beginning, um, and the system might not work correctly on our infrastructure. And if you've ever wondered why is it that everything in government has to work on Windows and requires an outdated version of Internet Explorer, costs heaps of money, and is supplied by proprietary software companies via enormous requests for proposal, now you know. So the problem isn't just that those of us at Linux Conference probably think that all uh, that governments always been wrongly assessing the risks. The problem is also that the risks have actually changed. And that's what we need to talk about when we talk about open source and government. So let's do that. Let's talk about open source. Um, and we're going to start by talking about what's changed in local government IT in the last decade. So there are now more people interacting with every system. It's not just staff. It's members of the community. It's random people. Um, it's people on Twitter making, you know, art objects and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff now. Um, there's more systems interacting with each system. So uh, there's a lot more... To, like, it just makes sense now to think about things talking to each other and uh, we're now talking about master customer databases and, hey, how come I, I can log into this system and do this but then I have to log into this other system to finish the... Uh, you know, finish the process. There's more interfaces. So, you know, people are bringing their own smartphones to work and saying, hey, how come I can't check my email um, on my own phone? And so suddenly there's way more sort of screens. Um, and that means uh, that there's more options. So a lot of things are now running in web interfaces and in browsers. And then, of course, there's cloud as well. So there's all this stuff going on. which basically means everything is connected to everything all the time. And unsurprisingly, that has ramifications. So there's an increased need to focus on security and privacy, which is something I wish would happen more in local government, but we're getting there. Um, and there's way more attack vectors. Um, and this is just going to become more and more the case um, now that we're starting to have some compulsory reporting requirements, because uh, people will actually find out about it. Um, there's an increased need for systems to talk to each other, and there's a decrease in the importance of uniform operating systems and hardware, which local government IT are obsessed with. Um, because your, your interface, your user interface, could be running on a Windows PC, maybe, but it could also be running on a Linux laptop, or an iPhone, or an Android tablet, or some other thing you've never heard of. Um, and because we're now looking at systems that are facing community members, there's a much greater increase in expectations about improvements to the software and the interfaces. Basically, the problem we've always had is that only government staff are looking at the interfaces and they can't take their business somewhere else unless they quit their jobs. So um, now that we've, uh, we've got other people looking at it, there's, um, there's a lot more sort of uh, fingers in the pie. So those changes all, I think, favour open source. Um, so, that, you know, this proven security benefits, no cryptographer who wants to be taken seriously, you know, believes in proprietary software. Basically, they won't trust anything that's not open. Um, open standards help systems talk to each other. Web browsers will run on pretty much anything. And um, open source allows us to make changes uh, according to our own budget and schedule. So you know all this because you're open source people. Um, but there are three factors in particular that apply to local government. So, uh, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, I'm not sure about other states, but um, we've got rate capping. So there's actually a legislated limit on the amount that your local council in Victoria or in New South Wales can increase rates by each year. And typically it's actually below the real rate of inflation, so it, it's basically enforced austerity on local government. So we've got austerity budgets, we've got a real push for open government and um, what's often called community first. Um, so, I mean, in libraries, we're like, what was everybody else doing? But um, there's now a real focus on, you know, what does the community want? Um, and there's also the big thing, I think, is mobile computing. <clears throat> um, so Victoria has introduced um, rate capping, as I said, a couple of years ago. They've also introduced this thing called My Council, which is kind of like NAPLAN for local government. Yeah. 
Um, and um, I have a lot to say about that, but not right now. I'm sure you can possibly imagine what I was going to say about that. Um, but the, the rise in smartphones in particular has really changed a lot of thinking inside local government about how we can deliver our services. Um, and a lot of local governments have got a unit now that's sort of responsible for helping the organisation to realign itself in response to all of those three factors. Um, and they're called all different things, but at Brimbank they're called the Business Transformation Unit, so BT. And when BT was first set up, Brimbank was a real technology laggard. There was hardly anything was digital. I mean, there's lots of, you know, there was lots of software going on, but there was a lot of paper records and um, strange procedures. And we also had a, a little bit of a history of we buy it now and IT picks up the bill and looks after it later, um, which was a bit of a problem. So BT's job was to fix both, both, both of those issues. Uh, and I just happened to start at Brimbank just after that had all been introduced, which was awesome. Um, and just before, we had a new CEO who um, really took the lead on this. And he was like, we're a digital laggard and we need to be a digital leader and we need to do this really, really quickly. So he wanted to make it uh, easy and simple for residents to interact with the council and he didn't have very much patience for software vendors who were like, yeah, we can totally connect it to that other system. It was just going to cost you like $200,000. It's no big deal. And, and Paul was, he was not happy about that. So um, he, we created an IT governance group which had senior staff, decision makers. It had the CEO on it, the finance director, you know, people who could actually make decisions. Um, and suddenly every new IT project, regardless of how big it was, had to be approved by the IT governance group before anything was allowed to happen. Um, and in fact, this was so new that I didn't even know it existed um, until <laughs> I was trying to work out how to get approval for my new, my, my new project. And they're like, oh, you've got to go IT governance. Like, what is that? Um, but it was a really great idea because, it, um, because IT governance were really interested in, um, you know, does it have open standards? Is it integrated uh, with other things? Or can it be integrated with other things? Is this going to lock us into some vendor for like 10 years? Um, and if you didn't have a sensible answer to any of those questions, you were just told to go away and come back later with a better answer. Um, so we changed our assumptions. And if you change your assumptions, then the risk assessment changes as well. Um, so I think that's actually the key. Probably should change my slide on my other computer too. OK, so these are the new assumptions for local government software. People interacting with the software should be able to do it on their smartphone, on the couch, in their underwear at 10 p.m. And that, is, that, that was actually literally, that, that was what our business transformation unit, that was like their number one goal. For it. They were like, every service in council, you should be able to do this. They, they even had a little poster of um, Homer Simpson in his undies with a, with a smartphone. <laughs> Um, the software should be updated regularly with improvements and bug fixes. Amazing. <laughs> the software should have a documented API. That was basically the number two question. It was like, does it have open standards? Does it have an API? This is what they ask every single person who goes to IT governance. Um, so it should have a documented API, open standards, and be capable of talking to all of our major software systems. So we've got like zillions of software systems. It doesn't need to talk to everything, but there's like three or four that are pretty important needs to talk to at least a couple of those. Um, procuring software is a long-term investment that requires different assessments to other types of expenditure. It's actually not like buying trucks. Proprietary software vendors will probably use their monopoly power and maximise their profits. Um, that's an assumption we're making now. And um, the other really interesting one is we might be able to perform this task using software that we actually already are paying for. Um, and it's amazing how many large organisations buy lots of different things that actually do the same thing because departments aren't talking to each other. <clears throat> and we get a bunch of new risks. So the first risk is the council will pay too much because the procurement process was insufficiently competitive. That may look familiar to you. This is still a risk. It doesn't matter whether you're buying open source or you're being new business transformed, that's still a risk. It's still really important. It's public money. We've got to spend it sensibly. The system might not perform the necessary functions because it wasn't tested sufficiently 
or our need to change. Notice the change in language there. It's not necessarily about getting all of your requirements up front in some massive RFQ, sorry, RFP, rather. Um, it's about making sure that you've checked before you commit. Um, system will not be customizable to our needs because the vendor wants to charge too much or it's not on their roadmap. I love that one. Um, the system will not be able to talk to our other systems because it has a really obscure API or none or it doesn't use open standards. So that's actually become one of the number one risks that, um, that Brimnank's looking at now. It's um, not too fussed about whether it's proprietary or, or open source in terms of the licensing of the product, but if it can't talk to anything else, we're not super interested in it. Um, council might pay for, some, for something that does the same thing as something else we're already paying for, which we kind of mentioned already. And the other one, which is really interesting, this has actually come from, from our process for Capital Works. What is the risk of not doing anything? And that's a risk that's never really traditionally looked at with software and systems in, in councils. It's kind of assumed that, oh, there's no risk from, from doing nothing because we've got a system that does, <laughs> does all this stuff, right? But, but if the system you're using is super insecure and has massive bugs and hasn't been patched for three years and can't be because the vendor actually, you know, became insolvent two years ago, that's, that's a big risk. Um, so that's, that's something that's being considered now. Um, and, and as I've intimated, this is broadly the approach that, um, I mean, I've added some of my own here, but this is broadly the approach that uh, Brimbank's uh, digital transformation team's looking at. Um, and it sort of turns a traditional local government idea of risk on its head, because we're now looking at, well, what's the risk of doing business the same way we've already done it? Actually, that's quite risky. So if we take another look at what, um, well, before we do that, I'll talk about the other thing in my notes that I forgot. Uh, so, yeah, so doing nothing is basically a greater risk than doing something a lot of the time now. And doing new things the same way we used to do them is also a bit of a risk. So if we remember what citizens want, they want government services to be easy, clear, reliable, consistent and responsive. So what we're focusing on now is, sure, they still need to be reliable and consistent, but they also need to be easy to understand, they need to be clear, and we need to be responsive when people um, give us feedback. So, historically, what we'd do in a public library is we'd make sure our software was really reliable and consistent, and we would use our staff, our highly trained staff, to use the software to make the library experience easy and clear for library users. So the thing that makes it clear and easy for library users is actually the staff. It's actually not the system. Um, which means that there's never any pressure for the system itself to be clear and easy to use because it's only staff using that and we can train them. It's no big deal. Um, and we're responsive through our staff, our practices and our policies. So because our staff were the only ones interacting with the system, we could sort of change our procedures and and you know, kind of have some grey areas in our rules and stuff which just sort of work around the things that technically the system sort of didn't let you do. But when you enable people to renew their books on their smartphone in their underwear at 10pm, you can't do that anymore. You've got to build in all the exceptions and the workarounds that your staff used to take care of into the actual system. And you've got to build interfaces that work for the general public and that's super different to the usual way that government and enterprise software is built, because it's normally built for staff. So Sid Harrell wrote a Twitter thread about this, um, also in the context of the Hawaii Missile Fossil Alert, <clears throat> explaining why the problem is systemic. So it's kind of the same thing as, as the other article I was talking about. And, and specifically what Sid was talking about is that this is not a user interface problem. You know, like all of these UX experts getting on Twitter saying, oh, you know, they should just, that button should have been different. She's like, no, you're missing the point here. Yeah, generally, it's assumed that professional employees, especially mid-level white-collar people, not the shiny creatives, should deal with what the system hands them, and training will patch any issues. Uh, 
And then she goes on to say, very few frontline employees encounter a new software package for their core tasks until they're sat down in a training class about it. The idea that software that requires extensive documentation is bad software is not current in this context. It's a really great thread. Um, but I want to focus on this specific thing for a second. So building an interface for a dozen or even a hundred staff members whose training and work environment you can control is really different to building an interface for tens or hundreds of thousands of members in the general public. And, and those, those members of the general public will cover the whole entire spectrum of digital and English literacy. So uh, in Brimac, we've got uh, people with you know, digital literacy like yourselves. We've got people who've never used a computing device in their lives. We've got PhDs. We've got people who speak two words of English. We've got to cater to all of those people with our services and our interface. And we don't know who they are <laughs> because they're just, they're just, you know, going on their phone and looking at our website. Um, so you need an interface that's easy to use, clear in its layout and language, and your organisation needs to be responsive to feedback from your, from your users and not responsive as in, oh yeah, thanks, we'll take that on board. Um, we actually need to take those suggestions and complaints and act on them. Um, now that's all possible with proprietary software, but it's so much easier with open source. And that's because open source gives you flexibility. And it also gives you modularity, and I'm going to talk about those quickly too. Um, so free software and open source proponents um, talk about liberty and the ability to read the source code and you can change the code yourself and you can share your changes and it's so awesome and you don't have to ask for permission to do any of these things. And they also talk about the injustice of public money being spent on technology that's not shared as a public good. And I'm with you people. <laughs> I also passionately believe those things. But you know what? Most local government staff don't. They don't care. What they care about is does it work? Does it work the way we need it to work? And can it easily be changed to work a different way if our needs change? So that's what we need to talk to them about. The third question is key. Local government's under a lot of pressure now to be actively and publicly responsive to community needs. And for local government managers, whether or not we can share the code or we have to pay a licence fee is much less important than whether we can direct feature development or make adjustments to layout or business logic. Now, you might be thinking those are the same things. They don't think they're the same things. That's not how they think. So what do I mean by modularity? Basically, you know, it's the ability to build in new features or fixes in small little chunks. And then you can add them as a plug-in code or you can upstream them to the main project or do whatever you want. But it gives us quite a few advantages from um, a local government bureaucrat point of view. Um, it gives us more granularity and control, but more importantly, it's actually much easier to budget for. So we can, we can build in a development bucket of money and then we can just build in the little new features as we need to, um, rather than going through some 18 month process to document all of the features we need and then get a big chunk of money for the whole new system. So um, I think that's, that's something that's not talked about in terms of uh, um, the advantage of open source enough. Um, and also, we, you know, they can be discrete, pro discrete projects, so we can actually give that little feature to that company and that little feature to that company. So we don't, we don't have to bundle them all up and, and have some massive big project. Okay, now this one's actually for the glam people um, more, than, more than the tech people here, but I do want to quickly talk about procurement processes and I know I've only got about three more minutes, so I'll try and make this quick. Um, so tenders are about making sure that Government contracts are transparent and fair and they're not corrupt. We talked about that before. So it addresses those, those risks. And it sort of doesn't matter whether it's, you know, what the system is, it's still important. But a lot of local government officers think that the requirement to go to quotes or tender means asking for proposals for a product in a particular category, in our case, a library management system. So 
traditionally what, what we would have done is we would have gone out to market and said, hi, we're, we're in the business, you know, we're in the market to get a library management system. Um, here's our 200 page requirements list. Um, you know, please, please give us an offer. <clears throat> but um, if you do that, then you're comparing apples with oranges as soon as you've got proprietary and open source next to each other because the business models are so different. And it's also actually not true. So local government procurement rules don't actually say you have to do that at all. What they say is that you have to have a competitive process for every contract. That's for every contract, it's not for every system. Um, so we know the problems with RFPs. They're a big long list of solutions. So here are the solutions we already came up with. You have to, your system has to have these ways of solving these problems. They're not actually a list of these are the problems we want solved. Um, so they say you've got to have this feature. It has to work this way. Rather than here are all the outcomes we want, here are all the problems we have, what can you do for us with your system? And the really cool thing about open source is that um, you can just find out for yourself. So just download it and check it out and work out how to solve the problem. Or work out whether the problem can be solved. Um, so basically, that's what we did with Koha. So we actually looked at it. We um, had some assistance. Thanks, Donna. Um, and uh, put in a demo system. We checked it all out. And we went, OK, well, we need it to do this. Like, we don't care how it does that, but it needs to have this outcome. Yes, it looks like it can do that. Great. And then we went to request for quotes for Koha. So we didn't say we want a library management system. We said, we're going to move to Koha. Um, and we need staff training, we need migration, we need system config, and we need support. Your three companies who operate in Australia who offer those services, would you like to offer us a quote for that? And it was completely within all of the normal procurement rules. All right. I'm not going to talk very much about this because you sort of all know this, but it's, it's that old chestnut, is open source cheaper? And my answer to anyone who asks me this is the classic answer, it depends. <laughs> um, now, I was pretty upfront with our management. I was like, this is so not going to be cheaper next year. <laughs> this is going to be way more expensive next year than it would have been if we just rolled over our contract uh, for business as usual. But we would also have a really crappy system that falls over all the time. Um, but after five years, I reckon we're going to be ahead. Even if we um, do what I, I think really is important, and I'm going to skip over all of my notes here except for this last bit, and say um, it's really tempting for, particularly for people in my position, to go, oh, Open source has a zero, zero price. It's free. Um, and you should never do that. So um, we need to set aside money for you know, migration and hosting and support and all of that stuff. But um, whenever I talk to library people about this, I say, you've got to try and put aside some money for development as well. Otherwise, all of the benefits of open source are basically wasted. It's just like having a proprietary system. Um, that you can't control. I've taken up all my time, but I'm going to go for a couple more minutes. Because <laughs> I can, because I've got the microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, so what to talk about when you talk about open source and local government? If you're talking to service delivery staff, um, you need to talk about flexibility and control. So don't talk about freedom, talk about flexibility and control. So they will be able to control um, what's changing and they'll have some flexibility. Um, and you need to talk about responsiveness because they're really interested in helping solve problems for community members, remember? So you need to explain to them, this will help you to respond to those problems better. And if you're talking to senior bureaucrats, what you need to talk about is how open source will help them to reduce risk because that's what they're really interested in. They don't want to be on the front page of the newspaper. They don't want to have to go to the CEO's, CEO's office and explain to the CEO why 
everybody in their municipality now knows that council's incompetent, right? So you need to talk about vendor lock-in, the inability to respond to community feedback, and you need to talk about security and user privacy. They won't want to hear about that, but you need to talk about it anyway. Um, we talk about interoperability, open standards, commercial support options. You need to make sure there are some, because that makes people comfortable. You need to talk about flattening out expenditure so that we don't have a contract every three years where we pay zillions of dollars and then we pay nothing for another two years and then we have another big... You're like, no, we'll just pay every year. Um, and don't call it free and make sure you've got money set aside for development. And when they ask you who else is using it, if it's Koha, you can say the whole country of Turkey is using it. Hundreds of public libraries in the US, Delhi Public Library in India, New South Wales Parliamentary Library, and you can say Brimbank's using it. <laughs> and you can say, I know this guy called Hugh, and he would love to talk to you about it. And this is how you can contact him. Um, so, so that's open source in local government, and I'm happy to take any questions or sit down or whatever you want me to do.